Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 35, we're going to talk about critical listening. Now, if you're new to tubes or you just got your first tube amp, it probably sounds fantastic. But give it a week or two and you'll probably start to hear the flaws. And this is how to go about logically figuring out what needs to change. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Last week we talked about tube synergy, and this week we'll talk about a related subject, critical listening. Now, what does listening have to do with tube synergy? And what the heck? I already listen to my system all day long. Well, if you want to improve your system, and who doesn't, you need to know what's working and what's not. And that's why critical listening is so important. Here's the simple score sheet I use for all tube and system reviews. Let's take a quick look at it. So I note the equipment, I note the tubes, and the special variations of the tubes. In this case, I did this, um, this listening session for the uh, Tube Synergy uh, lab last week. And this is the lineup that I really was enjoying. And in this case, I was running the, my favorite vintage Svetlana EL34 as the power tube. But everything matters, so I've written everything down. Now my basic system, other than the preamp, tends to stay static. So that part's easy. Now, the music is absolutely critical. So I open up, I like to listen to the bass first. It's just the way I am. You can do it differently. My track that I love for bass is the Fiend Brothers uh, tribute to the music of Dave Brubeck. And it's, it's a fabulous high resolution recording. It's, it's called a one microphone recording. I believe that's the name of the studio even. And they just use one high quality, uh, I believe, stereo microphone. And that means that they've got a placement of the audience and the musicians all have to be very carefully planned out because it's going, it's a straight DSD recording. As far as I know, it doesn't, it goes through a very simple mixing console and that's it, that's your recording. It's a one shot live recording. And, um, it, it's actually quite interesting what happened. They recorded in a fairly large studio, or let's say a medium-sized studio, and somebody goofed up the audience size. You know, normally for something like that, you're just going to have a handful of, uh, of listeners to sort of give the musicians a feel for an audience. And you're going to have family and friends, and maybe, you know, people that are hanging around the studio would join in. But somebody overbooked, so they ended up with a, quite a crowd, really pushing hard on the stage, basically. And somebody commented that that may have actually contributed to a better recording. And I think they're right. Anyways, um, the track that I listened to is called um, Unsquare Dance. And it op the important thing is it opens with a solo bass line, an upright acoustic bass line, which is fabulous for listening to the, to the low end of the system. And then it kicks into, the full band kicks in, and the recording has got really wonderful detail. It's very dynamic. The resolution is about as high as you can get today. And import, more importantly, it also has, on top of everything, it's got, with that, with that great detail, often comes a great soundstage. And this recording is no exception to that rule. Next, I move into something that Anybody who's gone to an audio show has heard Niels, Niels Lofgren, um, Keith Dunko. Um, it's a classic track for, for testing systems. Uh, most people are sick of it. I've, I've, I've gone from loving it to being sick of it to accepting the fact that I really need the track. It does a really great job at the high frequencies. Now this is his live version. The resolution is only CD quality. Uh, but it's a very good CD quality. It's got some good detail, and the high frequencies are really wonderful. 
lots of sparkle up there to listen to. So you, it's a good test for tweeters. It's a good test for the top end. It's a good test for the tubes. It's a good test for the cables even. And about halfway through it, it's got a really interesting transition from uh, very high frequency notes on the guitar to the lowest notes possible. And um, and that transition is, is valuable as well because the system has to shift gears and follow those notes. And, um, and it's just an overall really great track for testing systems. Next I go into the mid-range. And this I actually had the hardest time. I spent a long, long time trying, interviewing different, different tracks for the mid-range test. And I tried male vocalists, female vocalists, ensembles. I really, I had a hard time. And then I found Eva Cassidy's Ain't No Sunshine. And I've settled on that. It's been in rotation for a long time. She's got a rich voice. Her, even though she wasn't a famous musician and she passed way before her time, the people who were recording her obviously cared and loved what they were doing. Because her recordings are really well done. They're... Uh, the resolution is CD resolution, but it's great CD resolution. And Eva Cassidy really um, allows me to listen to the mid-range. I want to listen to the tone, um, how, the, how it's presented, where the singer is, and um, uh, you know how much, rich, how much richness the, the system's adding or taking away um, from the song. And last, I often rotate a fourth track that, right now, this has been in for a while. It's, it's from the, um, the remake of the movie A Star is Born. And the track is Is That Alright? And this is uh, the Lady Gaga version. And this is an example of an ultra-modern, very digital, you know, very PCM recording that's very well done. Yes, it sounds very digital, uh, but it still sounds great. And I get some, I get a mid-range vocal out of this. I get some good detail, but most importantly, the engineers put her front, center, forward, up a little bit, and her, so her soundstage presence on the recording is is amazing, and it really helps um, decide whether or not your system is set up properly, and whether or not the the singer is where um, the engineers wanted to place her. And it's really quite unique. I've never heard anything quite like it. So those are my, that's my standard lineup, whether I'm testing um, a preamplifier, a customer's tubes, or a cable, or a speaker. I use the same lineup, so I'm very familiar with it. So let's, now, when you're, when you're doing a, a, a listening session, you're only doing two things. You're going to be quickly making some notes as you go, and you're listening. That's it. So I set up my score sheet so that I can make the notes very rapidly without distracting myself. So in this case, I ticked off the bass that's good. I made a note plus, so a little better than good. Nice tone, neutral. Mid-range, very good. A bit forward, CCC. What the heck's that? Crisp, clean, and clear. Good detail. Treble, very good. CCC. Great clarity, underlined. And then when I'm done listening to my test tracks, not after, right away, I make a conclusionary note. So here I mark good, good plus detail, sound stage, taken as a whole, excellent, underlined. Okay, let's look at another one, really quickly. So the only change I made is I subbed the vintage Svetlana 6550C, which is my favorite KT88 type, and I'll show you why in a minute. So the bass was very good. It was a bit forward. Nice punch, which is very, very common of the KT88 type. That's what you get out of those, those tubes. But look at this. Mid-range was good plus, neutral, and sweet, which is not common. And a KT88 is it's a you would expect an EL34, which is a pentode, to sound sweet, but not the beam-powered tetrodes, which are what the KT88, the 6550 um, are. And so that that makes that sort of a nice crossover tube. 
Trouble was very good. The three C's. A bit of sparkle. I like to look for sparkle. It's not often in the music. It is in Keith Donko, and we're looking for it. And sparkle is often a product of the whole system. Something's adding that little bit of sparkle, and it just adds sort of a sense of a live performance, which really brings the music alive. It improves the overall enjoyment. So I like to look for it, and I definitely note it if I hear it. In conclusion, amazing soundstage, great detail underlined. And the, it's not hard to see why I got behind that tube. And I made some quick subs just to see if there was some room for improvement. So I dropped in the GE6SL7, which is no slouch. It's a good tube, but it's a budget tube. So bass is neutral, mid-range is the same, treble I marked the same. But here, this is interesting, I marked the sound stage was less and the detail was less. And it's not surprising, the GE is less than half, I think, of a Sylvania and uh, melts. The GE um, would be a tube I would recommend to somebody that wants a budget set of tubes. They can't afford to pay for uh, premium vintage, but they want good sound. They want to get 75% of what a very expensive set of tubes would cost. So the GE would be recommended. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, when I, when I was when I was in my 20s and I had a young family and you know kids that needed diapers, I I had to go budget. Later on, when you're more affluent, upgrade your tubes and your equipment, and keep you know keep that budget set as a spare, or pass it along to a friend who could use a helping hand. Also, I dropped in the Reflector 6SL7, which would I would call that an extreme budget or very affordable tube, and. It actually got a good review in the bass, great tone, forward. I didn't even bother the mid-range because look what I marked in the in the treble range. I marked OK. I could have said just OK. And that's a death sentence. When I review tubes, you'll rarely see me give you uh, a tube review of something that is weak, OK. It's a waste of time, right? I'm not going to promote a tube that I can't get behind 100%. Okay. So, that's a basic music selection and how to score and what to look for. Now, there's lots more that, um, that I'll be looking for. There'll be a pluck of a string in a recording. There'll be um, a little tap of a cymbal. There'll be a tap on the rim of a drum. Uh, there'll be a, the stomp of a foot. You name it. You'll get used to your recordings. That's why you keep repeating your test recordings. And you'll be listening for that tap of the foot. Sometimes it's even somebody's dropped the drumstick and in a high resolution system you can easily hear that. It gets picked up even though it's in the distance of a mic. It'll get picked up. And, um, and of course in live recordings you can hear these little quiet coughs and things like that that are, that are buried away. So, is that all I need to know? No. Listening critically requires a number of things in addition. First, the listening environment needs to be quiet. Next, you need a block of time with zero distractions. Put the phone or tablet away, far away. Now line up the tubes and equipment you want to listen to. Make up a score sheet. Note the tubes and the music. Now sit down in a good, centered listening position and get started. Listen to the same tracks in the same order at the same volume and make notes as you go. If you're not sure about a passage, go back and listen again. Sometimes I'll go back three times. When you're all done rolling the tubes in your equipment, you'll have some notes and a much better understanding of what you'd like to improve. Now, don't go all crazy. Focus on one aspect of the system at a time. Maybe just a pair of preamp tubes, or the power tubes, or just a cable. So, for example, if you're, if you're testing cables, just replace one pair. When you make changes, do them one at a time. Let me repeat that, one at a time. Now you can easily compare that single change to what you heard before. That's it. 
Easy peasy. The main thing is to take your time and focus, focus, focus on just the music. Okay, some really nice and in-demand tubes came in this week. Let's have a look at some of them. I love original boxes. And of course, this is the, the Svetlana EL34 box with the Flying C logo. They had a number of logos. And in the Russian alphabet, in Cyrillic, the C is RS, right? So Svetlana Electronic Devices, SED. Let's just have a really quick look at it. I don't want to run too long here. Can you see it's got the large stylized S logo and the date code is 9933. So the Russians start normally with the year. So 1999, 33rd week. And this is testing really nice. The um, the Svetlana EO34 is typically test somewhere in the 30 milliamp range, so 39 is really excellent. And a bunch of those came in, and I, I, I sell a lot of the Svetlana tubes. People really love them. So I, I keep bringing them in, and <laughs> as fast as I can bring a quad in, out they go. Um, with any luck, they sit in my own system for a few days, so I can get a good handle on whether they're... they're they're running good. And a huge pile of these beautiful Tungs Ram tubes in original factory boxes came in. And the boxes are little, you can see they're a little tiny, you know how paper deteriorates, but they're really in beautiful condition. Um, I like this tube, the E80CC, which is in close, well, not a close, it's a it's a may, I call it a maybe substitute for the 12 AU7, which is a very common preamp tube. And um, in fact, the EDCC, the 12 AU7, and the 6SN7 are so close as uh, preamp tubes that you can actually interchange them with different wiring and sockets, of course. You can interchange them in the same circuit. Isn't that interesting? So I like this tube so much, I designed and built a, a prototype preamp for it. And um, and it's really quite interesting. I have a 6 or 12 SN7 preamp, and the two tube types in almost identical circuits sound almost completely different. One is, like, the 6 SN7 is a, a beautiful, lush-sounding, warm presentation. The E80CC is clear, clean, and crisp, very detailed, great sound stage as a result less of that tube warmth, nowhere near what I would call a solid state sound, Very, still a very tube sound, but very different than the 6SN7. Anyways, um, these labels, um, I've learned through hard experience, come off instantly with uh, alcohol water blend, which is what I use as a standard uh, cleaning solution. I put a little tiny drop of um, biodegradable dish soap in my mix, uh, just to help clean off the crud. But with new tubes like this, typically, um, depending on the orientation of the box in storage, the, the end, typically the top, will be covered in dust, and there might be a few smudges on the tube from handling at the factory, and the pins may need a little tiny brightening, but they come out of the box looking pretty much like this, which is not surprising, because other than testing at the factory, they haven't been used uh, for at least 50 years. And um, so it was a it was a really great find. Sometimes they get lucky, and, and somebody's cleaning out a warehouse, and they, they have a nice big lot of tubes, and I'm always looking for my favorite tubes, tubes I get behind, so I, I buy everything. And inside the boxes, not all of them, but many of them, they have this neat little sheet of paper. Now, Tungsram was in Hungary, of course, uh, so this must be in Hungarian. O often they'll have a couple of different languages, but I'm pretty sure that this is all one. I have no idea what it says. Maybe somebody who's um, who can read Hungarian can read that and put the a rough interpretation down in the comments. At the bottom here, it says Tungsram 1972, and the stamp, this would be a, you know, a, a, probably a factory date stamp, 
2088. So that might be the 20th week of 1988, possibly. And a lot of these tubes have very similar stamp codes. So uh, it's a broken up box that's been, you know, open, let's call it open stock. So it's the remnants of probably a number of cases uh, that ended up in this lot remaining in a warehouse. Anyways, let's put those away and this is something completely different. This is what a bag of poles looks like. And a while ago I bought a huge collection of tubes and a lot of poles, hundreds, thousands of poles. And I'm slowly working my way through. And I'm at the 12AT7s right now. And the reason why the 12AT7 is an interesting tube for lovers of vintage is that the 12AX7s become extremely expensive, at least the desirable vintage tubes. And the 12AT7 is a very close sub. It's a lower output. It's about 70% of the output of a 12AX7, but it'll work in most 12AX7 circuits just fine, perfectly fine, in fact. And in some circuits, your 12AX7 is actually too hot, and you actually want to tone it down. So you'll put a 12AT7 in deliberately. Um, I've got a custom phono preamp that is too... It's not too hot, but it, it is certainly got... Plenty of output with a 12AX7. So I've subbed the 12AT7 in there, and it's been... I can't even tell the difference, to be, to be honest with you. But the main thing to keep in mind is the 12AT7 tube is much, much more affordable than the same tube that's a 12AX7. Let's see if we can see some interesting tubes in the box. In the box. In the in the bag. Can you see through there? See those gold pins I got my finger on? That's, that's a Phillips. E81CC, which is the 12AU, uh, 12AT7, of course. There's a whole bunch of GEs. Oh, there's a tongue saw. Uh, what else can I see in here? There's another tongue saw. Tongues are really great tubes. There's a Marconi. Marconi made some really good tubes. Lots of GEs. Another tongue saw down there. Let's just flip it over for fun. Oh, look at what I see in here. Can you see it? There's a... There's a Philips SQ, special quality. Um, oh, there's another one in there. Anyways, um, I'm going to work my way through the bag sometime in the next couple of weeks. Well, there's a G five star. The sad thing about poles is that I'll go through this bag. It might be a couple hundred tubes, and there's a bunch of bags like that. I'll go through the whole bag, and anywhere from 10 to 50% of the tubes are garbage, and they'll just be thrown out. It's heartbreaking, but you need to clean up garbage tubes. They can't be resold in bulk to some unsuspecting buyer on eBay. That is not that's not good business practice. It's not moral. I will not do it. I only put in the store good tubes that I get behind. And I save the best for last. Hang on. Now, if you follow me, you know I have favorite tubes, and my favorite EL34 of all time, hands down, is the Mullard. Uh, 1960 series XF2s. They were often labeled 6CA7, as well as EL34, same two. And, um, the, uh, you know, if, I, I I often put a percentage beside performance of a tube. So in the case, if somebody asks me for an affordable EL34, I always recommend the Electro Harmonix. Um, it's a good, solid sounding, a good sounding, solid tube, rock solid. In fact, I've never had one fail in service, and it'll get you about 75% of your potential for your amp, depending on what you're playing them in. The Svetlana EL34s that gets you 95% of the way there. So, you would think the Mullards would be 100, wouldn't you? The Mullards are so good. The mid-range has been, people have called it like listening to liquid gold. Not that I have a clue what that means. Well, I sort of do. Maybe you do as well. Um, but if I was to put a percentage on the Mullards, I'd say they're like 120%, 150%. They're that good. Uh, it's a very unique sounding tube, in a good way. Um... And look at this. Look at these numbers. This is how they've been... For months, I've been only getting occasionally one tube in. That's how they come in. I find one, 
maybe two. If I'm really lucky, one day I found six all at the same. There were six separate listings <laughs> and they were expensive. Um, and that's a problem with desirable vintage tubes is the price just keeps going up. It's insane. But what happens is I bring in, I bring in a tube. I'll, I'll have a little handful. I'll test them. And then I match pairs. That's how quads start out. Quads are actually two match pairs that are close together. The pairs have to be very tight. The two pairs should be close. They don't have to be exactly the same. Look at this. The GM is 114 and 114. But look at the emissions. 33 milliamps, 34. When you set the bias on an amp, you're setting the emissions bang on between tubes and between sections, right? So your whole quad will be emitting at the same at the same um, same rate. So 33 and 34 is virtually identical. On my test equipment, that's probably well um, within uh, the, the variable range of the equipment itself. So 31 and 34, that would be acceptable. That would work. 30 and 34, that's starting to get a little bit outside of what I would consider acceptable. Anyways, I found a whole bunch of them in the last two weeks. And shortly, I should have quads again. They're expensive quads because the wholesale price is so expensive and it takes a lot of tubes to make a quad. I need 20 to 40 of these suckers to match one good quad. Now, I still have the rest of the 20 or 40 tubes. So when a couple more tubes come in, I might get, you know, a little further along to matching a new quad using all of my base inventory. But without that base inventory, you're, it's hopeless. I, I often will buy um, what people call match quads and I'll bring them in. I'll bring in one match quad. Sometimes I bring in 10 match quads and I have given up relying on other people's testing. I'll just break the quad down and test it and re rematch them up because virtually everybody who says they've got a match quad, there'll be three good tubes, one bad tube. That's, you can't operate a, uh, a quad and push pull with one mixed, one unmatched tube. It doesn't work folks. It just, it, it just, it ruins the sound. Anyways, oh, I wanted to show you this. Look at this. See that? Dynaco. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, David Haffler and his partner had a company that made an uh, affordable um, EL34 push-pull Class A, A, B amplifier. It was called the ST70. And um, you could buy it as a kit. If you were tight for money, you bought it as a kit. The the circuit board was assembled, but you had to put everything else together, or you could buy it factory assembled. They sold, um, I looked it up this morning, 375,000 assembled and kit versions of the ST70. And as far as I can tell, I get a lot of vintage Muller DL34s in that are Dynaco branded. So can you imagine back in the day you would buy a very affordable amplifier, tube amplifier, and it came with one of the best EL34s ever made. Now, maybe um, Dynaco was buying enough tubes that they were able to cut a good deal with Mullard. Whatever happened, I don't know. Uh, Haffler is famous for wanting quality, and, and, you know, he wanted affordable quality, which is what I want, too. You know, I've never been rich, um, and I've had... <laughs> had periods in my life in which I've been very unrich. It's <laughs> a nice way of saying it. But um, he wanted he wanted everybody to be able to afford his equipment, but he wanted it to sound good. And so he didn't compromise on the power tubes. Today, and even back then, it was, it's been very common forever in a day. If you buy a piece of new tube gear, there's a very good chance you'll get rebranded tubes with the factory name on it. Whatever, whoever made it, and um, and they'll be crap. It's just the way it is. If if you were to take an amplifier, a tube amplifier with nine tubes, like the Wilsonton R8, for example, and put good quality tubes in there, you'd add 50% to the selling price. 50%. So it's not. It wouldn't be competitive in today's marketplace, and it wasn't going to be competitive at any time. So it's not surprising that you need to retube your your amplifiers when they come. Even good quality manufacturers today are only putting in budget quality tubes 
into their amps. They were fully expecting you to retube to get you know the best sound out of them. And whenever you see Great Britain in small print, large print, I always think I, I always say red alert. Maybe it's a mullard. How would you know? Take a look. You're going to have a manufacturing code on many European tubes that are from the Philips companies, Philips own Mullard. Down here, I don't know if you can see it. There it is. XF2 is your series code, so 1960s. And way at the beginning, there's a capital B. That's Blackburn, England. That's the plant. And then there's a date code. Sometimes they rub off, and then I have to identify tubes by the structure of the tube, tube itself. But in most cases, there's enough of the code left that you can do a positive ID. Okay, well, that was fun. If you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes. Remember, I have flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.